Thank you guys for joining us to Transitioning to Medicare. I am Danny Ratliff here with Richard Rosso. A lot of information to get into today. This seems to be an extremely hot topic, Rich. Um, we're going to talk about how your health insurance works so after you leave your job, or maybe you're already retired, needing to, to get on to Medicare. Lots of different enrollment periods, lots of questions we're going to get to, and hopefully address the majority of this within this, this webinar. So we are Clarity Financial doing business as RIA Advisors, an investment advisory firm here uh, registered with the Securities Exchange Commission in Houston, Texas. Um, this is not any recommendations, but purely educational. So have any specific questions, talk to your healthcare provider, or you know, we're happy to answer whatever we can as well uh, offline. So want to jump right in and talk about the main topics of, you know, healthcare in general, Rich. Who provides the majority of healthcare in the United States? Well, we all know it's generally our employer, right? We're able to get our health insurance or on our spousal coverage, and then there's Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare, and then individual VA insurance. So when you look at that silo or those hierarchies, you could tell that we try to help people transition from these various systems, most likely into uh, Medicare, but obviously well over 50% is your employer. Why people, a lot of times, Danny, we'll, we'll get into this, um, they're hesitant to retire before age 65 because then I got to figure out the bridge insurance between age 62 and 65. And Danny and I have multiple stories of how expensive that can be for most people. Some have different circumstances with retirement health care insurance benefits. But for most, that's a hefty proposition to move from employer to Medicare. So yeah, employer insurance is obviously the most popular, most prevalent. Yeah, it, it is extremely expensive. We do see people delay the retirement because of the cost of health care out of pocket without your employer subsidizing. Um, you know, a lot to cover and, and it's not cheap. So, you know, talk about the retirement health care challenge. I think, you know, we just kind of started to broach that topic. Uh, the number one issue or issue number one, smooth transition from employer insurance to Medicare. Why is this so important? And, you know, we talk about all the different enrollment periods and we're going to get into that in quite a bit of detail. But the importance of this is that you don't have any gaps in coverage right. and you also avoid those late enrollment penalties. This is, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of bad information that's out there. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one thing we want to make sure that you all avoid. It is. Um, there's this, um, this, this notion that um, coverage gaps, you know, when you, once you get on Medicare, that, that's it. You go on original Medicare AB, and I don't have any other gaps. Well, there are Medicare gaps, but then there's coverage gaps, right? So you've got pitfalls every step of the way from when you want to retire to when Medicare begins, and then when you start Medicare. And you've got gaps, coverage gaps between work life and retirement life. So you have to secure your adequate coverage through private insurance uh, until you get to Medicare, but then you have gaps that will have to cover what Medicare doesn't, as well as covering prescription drugs. That's right. And I think that, you know, understanding those first year health costs, whether you be on Medicare or, you know, just while you're waiting for Medicare to turn 65, is that all premiums are paid out of pocket. The additional cost I think that we take for granted a lot of times is that, you know, Medicare, even if we're talking about just Medicare in general, it doesn't cover the dental. It doesn't cover copay. It doesn't cover vision, hearing. Um, you know, those are things that I think we take for granted. We always kind of joke that we're going to have a lot of old retirees stumbling around who can't see, hear, or, uh, you know, chew. The issue always becomes is you, some people may not even be aware of what they pay because it just come, comes out of their paycheck. And then there's sticker shock when you say, oh, well, this coverage is okay for my employer. It's really good. And I only spend maybe 200 bucks a month or whatever it is. And then I realize I'm going to lose that before Medicare. And I go look at ehealthinsurance.com and I get estimates. I look at high deductible plans. You know, the ACA is not affordable. The Affordable Care Act is, should be un unaffordable health care act. For most people, it's going to be a problem. We run those in our plan. That's the most important part. One of the most important parts, Danny, of, under of putting your financial plan together, because you will be able to understand better, oh, what am I up against if I want to retire before 65? 
we try to estimate as best as possible what your premiums are going to be. And I want to tell you, could be a bit of a sticker shock. Not everybody's going to be able to do it um, without uh, their health care coverage. That's why, Danny, we talked about, I think, on the radio show last Friday, how couples stagger perhaps retirement. One couple, one, one spouse still works, so the retiring spouse can still remain on the health care insurance of the continue the, the person who's working uh, and then move on. So it's a graduated issue just because we want to get everybody to Medicare, but maybe someone cannot wait. Maybe someone can't wait to Medicare, but they can get on their spouse's coverage. So additional costs, dentals, co-pays, all of that has to be part of your financial plan. And if you're not doing a financial plan, you at least have to understand. This is one of the bigger misconceptions, I think, that when it's associated with Medicare, many people believe that, you know, Medicare is going to cover your long-term care. And this is really the elephant in the room in many financial plans that people are unprepared for it. Uh, we have a lot of experience seeing this where, um, you know, and usually what happens when people kind of get the fire lit under them to, to go and explore long-term care is when they have a loved one go through um, an instance and where they need it and they see the cost of it, say, shoot, we need to make sure that we're prepared here at home. Um, but Medicare does not cover this. And so it's not just anecdotal. We do see this quite often. We do see the numbers and the expenses from it. Uh, just one thing that needs to be taken in consideration when we're talking about Medicare, long-term care is certainly not the topic or uh, the main subject of today, but something that you do need to be aware of and keep in mind as you're updating financial plans, looking at seeing the costs associated with this and understanding that it is not included. Yeah, how if you, you know, if you want to understand what this is, if I if I'm ill, I have health care. If I fall and I break a leg or I go through a mental issue or some issue that prevents me from com completing certain activities of daily living, that's long-term care. That's not health care. I might have both, but um, long-term care, health care, two separate roads. Sometimes they work together, but they're not the same. Rich, let's jump into the agenda today. We have a ton to cover. Um, just briefly, yeah. what people can expect out of today's webinar. Yeah, how Medicare works with your employer insurance. Very important. Who needs to enroll? How to enroll? Uh, it's very easy to enroll in Medicare, by the way. I just helped client the other day. Went online to my office. We went ahead and went through it. It's very easy. Private insurance works with Medicare. How does it work? What's the hierarchy of how it works? How much can you expect to pay after going on to Medicare? So these, this is the... Uh, here are the topics we're going to uh, tackle today. So let's jump right in how Medicare works with employer insurance. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but if you're, I think this is one of the bigger questions we get. If you're 65 or older and you are entitled to, to Medicare, what exactly, who pays first, who needs to think about getting on Medicare or not? Yeah, there's a coordination of benefits and it's, there's actually on Medicare.gov, if you type in coordination of benefits, they actually have a nice booklet, uh, PDF that you can download because it does get confusing. Um, but if you're 65 or older, entitled to Medicare, but you have, you or your spouse are still working and the plan covers 20 or more employees, your group health plan is still going to be the primary and Medicare is going to pay second. Now, here's the caveat. I have a group health plan. I work for a company but it covers fewer than 20 employees. I work for a small business. Well, if I do have group health coverage, that's okay. But remember, I probably do need to sign up for Medicare for a myriad of reasons, which we'll get into. And who pays second is gonna be the group, right? If I have a group health plan with retiree coverage, um, and some people get this, some people have, when they leave their employer, and gosh, that's great. They have a retirement benefit for healthcare. Not many companies do, but some people that have been working for companies for multiple decades have this. And they want to know, well, when I'm retired, do I need supplemental insurance to complement my Medicare A and B? And well, yeah, but Medicare would pay first. And the retiree coverage, which is usually pretty good coverage, takes the place of my supplemental Medicare coverage that I'm going to need. And then this is the big one, COBRA, which is not group health insurance. Who pays first is Medicare. And second, 
is COBRA. Many people will think that when they go on COBRA, it's really an extension of their employer plan. So COBRA should pay first and Medicare doesn't. And there's a lot of problems with this and we'll get into with the COBRA thing. This COBRA is venomous. This one could bite you. Yeah. If you're not careful. Well, yeah, no, it certainly can. So what we're really discussing here is the coordination of benefits of it. When you're on both, what happens? Now, if you are under a group health plan and they may ask you to go sign up for part A, but technically you don't need to go sign up for part B and D, if you're on a plan that is creditable and you have 20 or more employees, you're going to be okay. What these other plans, if you have fewer than, or you're on Medicare, you have retiree coverage, or even COBRA, um, and many times we find that COBRA is pretty costly, and a lot of times you can go just um, go find a supplemental that is cheaper. These are all what we're talking about right here. What's filling in the holes of meta, you know, kind of that what we call the gap. Um, so when you go get a meta gap policy or supplemental, this is what we're referring to here as far as who pays. That's all that is. So yeah, let's talk so, about who needs to enroll in it. Yeah. So I just want to keep in mind that um, you might say, well, Rich, Danny, I work in an office. There are only five people here. So obviously I don't, it's not, it's not a creditable plan. Don't just to make an assumption. Talk to your benefits department. They could be pooling benefits. They could have a, a headquarters, a different uh, subdivision. Right. You don't know. If you're sure it's a very small company, listen, I'm not, then okay. But for the most part, you want to check with your benefits department to see if you do have creditable coverage for Medicare and or prescription drug coverage. Yeah, that's a really good point, what you mentioned, if you work in a small office, because we are seeing more pooled plans. So where you may actually technically be covered. Uh, so keep that in mind. Always talk to your uh, your benefits group, but you also it, it would probably you know be beneficial to go talk to Medicare as well, just to make sure that everything adds up. Because what happens if you don't enroll, they're going to ask for you to prove um, evidence of that you were insured under a creditable plan. And so let's say you're you're 68, you've not been on Medicare, they're going to want to say, hey, we want to make sure that you are there, so you don't have that permanent penalty. And we'll right. talk more about that penalty in a minute. So this is if simple. You, who needs to sign up? And yeah, this is this is pretty basic here. If yeah, you're under 65, 65 and working, you just yeah, you know, you're not you're not eligible for it yet. Right. You're not eligible for Medicare. Uh, if for some reason you don't have your employer uh, anymore, then you go on your spouse's plan or you look at the, the health exchange, uh, your state's health exchange, or look at uh, you know, do your searches through a company like ehealthinsurance.com, or you may know an insurance broker that can help you. That's right. So under 65, continue with the plan, spouse's plan, no big deal, um, no Medicare, obviously. Now, if you're under 65 and retired, you may have that former employer with a retiree plan or the spouse's plan, as we just, just discussed. And if you don't have that, then you'll go out and purchase insurance through uh, your state insurance, insurance exchange. So keep in mind that they are regulated by each individual state insurances. Mm -hmm. So if you did move out of state, you want to look for another policy just to make sure that everything is still met. You're still on right. the right, right plan for you. Mm -hmm. So this is one that we kind of broached a little bit, but if you are over 65 and you are continuing to work, does your employer plan cover 20 or more employees? So if yes, you can stay on the employer plan and delay Medicare. From time to time, they may ask you to sign up for Part A, which you've paid into with your payroll taxes over time. No big deal to do so. But as you're doing so, make sure that you're only signing up for Part A, not B and D, because then you will be on the hook for those premiums. Right. And Part A sometimes has better health um, hospital coverage, believe it or not. So you want to check with your benefits administrator. Okay. It doesn't hurt you to right. sign up for Part A, right? Because you've already paid in. You're not going to pay any more for Part A. And we already went through the co coordination of benefits because some people say, well, I'm very scared to do it because, you know, then who pays first and what happens? So, you know, Part A, you might have to do it. But there is an important caveat, and this is um, really is. If your employer is a high deductible plan and it's paired with a health savings account, it's becoming more and more common, you're going to need to make a choice because you cannot contribute to the HSA if you're enrolled in any part of Medicare. And if this is the kind of plan you currently have, you've got to talk to your employer. Uh, maybe you'll have a different plan. Well, you could always go off your employer plan 
or get all your or get all your health insurance through Medicare. I have people that we run the numbers, and it is work for them. If they don't, if their employer says, "Listen, you can sign up for Part A," we don't care. If you don't want to, don't. Well, if you're still contributing to an HSA and you're maxing it out every year, don't sign up for Part A. Because contributing yep, to the no, HSA right. and the benefits you're going to get from the HSA are much more important than you feeling good about checking the box. Believe it, there are check the boxers out there. And I don't mean underwear. I'm talking, there are check the boxers that just feel like, oh my gosh, I need to sign up for Part A. I'm 65. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't need to. But I'm going through this like, I can't say they check box paranoia. Like, I got to I got to do it. I got to No, you have an HSA. We're not going to do it. Your benefits administrator says, don't do it. Don't worry. You're, you're good. Yeah. So, you know, take a step back if you have an HSA and realize so this one, is much more important benefit. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, one, one other important caveat to this and take it one more step is that you need to stop contributing to the HSA six months prior to going on Medicare so you don't right. disqualify any of those those contributions that you're making to the HSA. So keep that number in mind six months before you file or you, you file for your benefits, go ahead and cancel those contributions to the HSA. Now, sometimes there may be something that, you know, pops up and it's unexpected. They, uh, they go ahead, you're laid off, right? You have to quit because of a certain reason, but start thinking about that as you're getting closer to 65, or maybe you're still working and contributing to that. Um, you do need to stop those contributions six months prior to signing up. If you are over 65 and working, uh, same deal, 20 employees here. Um, no brainer. No, you must not yeah. Um, so if you're not covered, right, you must enroll Medicare at age 65. We do not want you guys to have penalties um, or have a lapse in coverage or have to say, hey, you know, we, we wanna make sure you sign up during your enrollment periods so you don't have to provide insurance uh, or eligible evidence of insurability, you know, that way we don't go through that route. And uh, it can become a lot more costly if this is not done properly. If you're age 65 and over working and the plan covers 20 employers, I mean, we're, we're really getting into kind of covering the same stuff over and over just in a different way. Um, talk to your benefits administrator to find out how your employer insurance works with Medicare, like Rich just mentioned a moment ago. Um, may be able to keep that employer plan. Usually you can have supplemental coverage, uh, but sometimes they want you to enroll in parts A. Every now and again, I'll see B, but B is pretty rare that they ask, actually ask you to go ahead and enroll in part B if you're on the employer plan. Um, and then can keep employer plan for drug coverage. If it's creditable, no need to enroll in part uh, D, which is your prescription healthcare coverage. Yeah, so this is, again, Right. This is a bit of a stickler one. Right. Because my employer doesn't have it. Um, I need I'm 65 or I'm going to be 65 in three to six months. I have to then consider it. I'm otherwise, like you said, clock's ticking for me to be penalized. And we'll talk about the penalties. But if you don't sign up in time, penalties go on forever. And here we're going to talk about it. Right. Well, once we get there. So you call SSA when you turn 65 what, to say you need to enroll in Part A, uh, B. You're working, they, um, if you ask if you need to, they'll say no. You're, if you're an over 20 plan, right, they'll probably say no. Keep a record of the conversation. Uh, if you are not working or are covered by an under 20 employer plan, they will say yes. So when you turn 65, whether working or retired, um, that's going to determine whether you need to sign up for A or B and whether the coverage is creditable or not, right? But so if you call and enroll in Part B, frankly, I don't, you know, this slide sort of confuses me because if I call SSA and ask if I should, I mean, are they really going to give me the answers? I've, got, I've been on the phone with people on this and I'm not sure. Um, yeah, not a whole lot I of confidence mean, there. Yeah, I mean, like Part A is really easy to sign up online. You get your, your SSA.gov. You get your one ID and you can sign up online. And actually the go-through for signing up is really easy, um, believe it or not. So, but keep in mind, 
Um, when you turn 65, I would say six months before you turn 65 and you're still working, that you want to have a conversation with your benefits administrator and you want to bring up this creditable coverage. Will I need to enroll in part A and part B? You're really, and, and or part D. And if, I, if you are creditable, can you send me the letter? Can you send me proof, which they should have, that they are creditable coverage? So that should be a no problem. So I would say if I'm, gonna, if I'm turning 55 and I'm working, I'm going to call my benefits administrator before I call the SSA. And I think more people are still, I mean, I know that you have, we have all the stats that a lot of people retire at 62, but I think a lot of people we work with, unless they have retirement healthcare coverage benefits, they're, they don't want to pay. It could be, I mean, I had a client that just paid, is paying $31,500 a year for healthcare coverage, right? That's not chump change. Because that's on the higher end of it. I mean, we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing between about 18 and 30, give or take, for somebody who retires, you know. That's a lot of money 60, if I'm retired. To, to 65. Yeah, it's a ton. Blows yeah. up a lot of plans. It does. It does. So now we're going to talk a little bit about enrollment. I know we have some um, questions about enrollment. Um, so the penalty is 10% penalty. If you don't enroll in Part B when you're supposed to, you're going to pay a 10% penalty for every 12 month period you should have been enrolled. That's why it's critical for you to get guidance before you turn 65, right? Now, if I make a mistake and I, and I go outside my window and we'll talk about this three or four months, I'm not going to get penalized. It's got to be 12 month period. And what do we find in what's the percentage of people that actually suffer these, what's the average late enrollment? Yeah, this is, this is crazy to me. The average penalty is 30%. So meaning that we're, we're messing this up by 36 months on average if you're not signing up at the right time. So that's a long time, right? Three years. And 30%, here's the issue with this penalty. It's not a one-time deal. It is a permanent penalty. Um, it is very difficult to go in and get this thing waived or alleviated from it, get some type of remedy. Um, it's impo there, almost it impossible. There. Almost impossible. I've yeah. tried. People try. I'm like, listen, if it makes you feel better. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. Now, here's the other mistake that I think this is probably rich, where most of the mistakes are made when it's associated to this penalty. It's Cobra. You get onto Cobra, you feel like it's the it's your employer plan. Uh, you've been let go or you stop working. Um, you have that full 18 months. You don't enroll. You're going to be charged that late enrollment penalty. So even though it feels like the employer plan, it is no longer considered a creditable plan. So you have, if you're past 65, you're gonna have that special enrollment period that from when you get off your, or when you cease to work, you're gonna have an eight month time frame, So an eight month window that you have to sign up in. But if you don't do it, that's where they're gonna start that clock and you're gonna be in big time. You could be in big time trouble with that permanent penalty. So keep okay. in mind, COBRA is not a creditable plan. You would think it, it is because it feels like it's part of yeah. something your employer offers, right? And remember, COBRA pays secondary to Medicare. So it's quite common for employees to go on to COBRA for 18 months after leaving employment. But, but you've got to remember, COBRA, like Danny said, is not considered creditable coverage. It's not an over-20 employer plan. So if you don't enroll in Medicare, you have eight months after your employer insurance terminates you may be charged a late enrollment penalty. So then some people have come off of COBRA after 18 months and found that they couldn't go into Medicare right away. Why? Because not only do I have a special enrollment period, that's eight months after I start work, but now I, I, I do my COBRA and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and sign up for Medicare. Well, guess what? Now it's say October and you are off COBRA. Well, guess what? Now you have a general enrollment period for Medicare. That's between January and March. And then that Medicare benefit's not gonna start until July. So this is a huge gap in your coverage 
So not only do I have the gap that I have to somehow fill, I also have my late enrollment penalty. So this has become a problem. Um, I think people are getting better, Danny, at understanding this COBRA issue. But boy, it's a double whammy depending upon when COBRA ends and when general enrollment periods begin and then when that coverage starts. So you could be, man, you could be at least six months, seven months, who knows how long you're going to have that coverage. That's someone that this happened to. And I said, listen, he goes, and I'm not going to get any health care insurance. I said, well, I would invest in bubble wrap. We'll come in, the office will wrap you up. Just like that commercial on TV where the guy's wrapping his car up in bubble, bubble wrap. Maybe we have to do that. I mean, it's, this is going to scary. Yep. No, it certainly is. So let's talk a little bit about how to enroll in Medicare, Rich. Um, you know, this is one of the deals that I think that it's easy to make a mistake. And, and, and the reason being is that, and the reason we, this website is up, and one thing I want everybody to take a look at, medicare.gov. You can go and you could go type in Medicare, and you're going to have medicare.org, medicare.com, all of these other sites that are going to look extremely similar to Medicare. Make sure that it is medicare.gov. The rest of them are trying to sell you something. Um, so go to medicare.gov, as you can see here where it's circled towards the middle of the screen, bottom left, uh, get started. It's gonna be a pretty simple process to go through it. Now I know this can be overwhelming because of the alphabet soups of it. Um, we, we can certainly give you guys some more specific directions on this, um, introduce you to people who can help you with it as well. But this is really important, medicare.gov, go to get started. And um, you know, once it's all broken down, I think we find that it gets a lot easier over time with this. Um, yeah, but you know, easy to make a mistake. It is easy to make a mistake, and keep this in mind that you're rolling for original Medicare A and B. And if you're receiving Social Security when you turn 65, you're going to be automatically enrolled in Medicare A and B. You can decline them if you wish. Right. But the only reason you're going to decline B is if you're working and covered by an employer plan that covers 20 more employees. Right. So if that's the case, you probably shouldn't even file for Social Security yet. You probably should be waiting until your full retirement age or at least age or for us, extended period to age 70. Uh, for many people, that works better. Um, we you probably hear us talk about that on three year show quite a bit. Um, so it's very easy. I went through it with everybody. It's very clear how they precede you along. Do you want to sign up for part B? And then they explain part B. You click the button, the radio button, no. Okay. And it 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 takes you through this process very easily. And then you can print out your result, you know, print out that you signed up for part A and or B if you need to. You'll have a confirmation in that and they'll also send you a letter. So it's not, it's not difficult at all to sign up online. Or you can just call the SSA at 800-772-1213. I personally, we did call the Social Security Administration and our hold time was going to be 35 minutes. So you know it was probably closer to 55 minutes. They are understaffed. So talking about the, the Medigap and kind of the, what that covers, how that works with it, um, with private insurance, right? So we talk about Medicare being Swiss cheese. And this is why it is important to not just go sign up for part A, B, and D. You need to get something that's going to cover the holes that Medicare has. Um, and so thinking about what you're going to have to do, you're going to have deductibles, coinsurance amounts, prescription drugs, uh, depending on the additional Medigap policy that you receive. This is going to help fill in that and help alleviate some of the burden associated with that. Yeah, some people think I signed up for A and B and I'm done. No, you just started. <laughs> so you kind of have to. So fill talk about gaps. how those gaps are, are, are filled. Yeah. So first, again, this is all private insurance, right? Um, you got to see one. Does your do you have an employer or retiree insurance that works with Medicare? Okay. Um, and we talked about this. If you if you so may want to keep it, right? If you have creditable coverage, but or maybe you just keep the drug coverage. So you want to at least talk about see that first. 
um, overall. Um, but if employer or retiree insurance is not available to you, you have two choices. You can take out what we talk about, which is Medigap. That's a Medicare supplement policy. And then you pair it with a prescription drug plan. Or you can watch the MeTV like I do and the Westerns and in between they'll talk about they'll have Joe Namath or Jimmy J.J. Walker come up and talk about their Medicare Advantage plan. Medicare Advantage plans are like HMOs for the most part. And they're going to have a network of providers that deliver your care. And this is called uh, Part C. And um, Medicare Advantage is all-inclusive. But you're always going to have to roll in A and B. It's just how are you going to fill the holes? Am I going to go the Medigap route? And that's what we recommend at RIA. And we'll talk about that. Why? Or the why of that. Or are you are going to take Medicare Advantage, which is probably people that are on this call, on this webinar, they probably see a lot of commercials that offer all kinds of things. You know, uh, Fitbits and silver sneakers and all of that, then that's Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage has come a long way. We'll talk a little bit about that as well, but um, we do prefer original Medicare. So considerations when you're signing up, can you continue to see your doctor? I mean, I think it's really important, generally speaking, when, you, when you're starting to, to broach the topic of Medicare and, and looking at overall Medigap insurance, we want to make sure that, you know, you make a list of your doctors, any specialists that you see, um, make sure that they take certain types of coverage and then uh, prescriptions for Part D. I think that this is one thing that, you know, it should always be addressed and looked at. And remember, just because your neighbor's on something, we do see this a lot. So say, oh, my neighbor had this plan. I'm, gonna, I'm going to get it. Well, your, may, your neighbor may have a much different lifestyle than you. They may have a much different life in, in what their intent is. Are you traveling overseas? What type of drugs are you on? I mean, all those things we just asked. Remember, this wants to be, we want this to be very customized to you. Medicare Advantage plan um, could be more affordable. Um, and we, we talk about this, right? Um, monthly premiums are important, but Medicare Advantage plans are going to have narrow networks. Um, you may not be able to see the same doctor you've been seeing. What about a specialist, right? Keep costs down. Some Medicare Advantage plans are excluding very specialists that you might want to see. If, say, you have a serious diagnosis, and this is this some particular um, remedy is being offered to you. Well, guess what? They may not offer it at Medicare Advantage. They may say, sorry, we, we, you are in this network and this is what we offer for this kind of cancer. Well, I've been reading about this and I talked to someone else and I went to see, I got a second opinion and they said, well, okay, well, sorry. Keep in mind with the Medicare, with a Medigap policy, you pretty much can see any doctor that accepts Medicare, and they're not limited to an insurance company's network. And we'll we'll talk about this, but I want you to keep this one thing in mind that's very important. When you generally purchase insurance, private health care insurance, we have ACA, right? That means uh, no pre-existing condition. Right, you have to be accepted. Well, guess what? That does not apply to Medigap coverage. So, if I say, and I have had people, unfortunately, that have gone through this, if they're on Medicare Advantage. It's affordable. They get all the they get all the bells and whistles, and they've got vision care and all of that. But then, one client of mine had gotten breast cancer, and there was some treatment that one second opinion said this is very effective. Um, you can you can get this coverage. Medigap, like just regular health insurance. But Medicare Advantage said no. She goes, well, I'm going to get off Medicare Advantage and I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go back on original Medicare and then I'm going to sign up for Medigap. Well, guess what? Too late. It's because you now have a pre-existing condition. You may or may not be able to get on Medigap. So up front, when you're in your enrollment period, you've got to go with the best overall insurance that's right for you. And Medigap is going to resemble, for the most part, the coverage you had while you were working. Because again, with the Medigap policy, you can see any doctor that accepts Medicare and you're not limited to a network. 
So it works like, I mean, and again, Danny talks about this a lot, but Medicare Advantage is moving ahead, going up. It's very profitable for health insurance companies, but they're becoming more PPO. They're, they're trying to understand or go through the pitfalls. But for now, Medigap is still one of the better ways to encounter coverage. But again, you can go to a Medicare, how many times do people go to a Medicare Advantage fund and go, listen, Rich, no deductible. I don't pay anything. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and Medigap coverage is like $195 a month. Okay, but well why? Let's look at the why. So the out-of-pocket costs are going to be higher if you're healthy with Medicare, Medigap. But if I go ahead and I have this serious illness and Medicare Advantage doesn't cover my coverage, I'm stuck. So this is a gamble you take, right? Based on your health, based on your budget, right? Danny, there are some people that have to go on Medicare Advantage because it's more cost effective and they need coverage. Uh, but it's yeah, a it's a more. cash flow issue. It's a cash flow issue. Yeah. But so like, like you mentioned, Medicare things. Advantage has made some strides in the right direction, um, oh. but still very profitable for the insurance company versus what you know typically we would prefer original Medicare, a lot more options, uh, more flexibility as far as what you want to do. Medicare Advantage has primarily been HMOs, closed networks, but they are offering more and more PPO services. So that is good. But, um, you know, I think that that's one other consideration that needs to be made. And also, a lot of times, we, we're seeing more employers as retiree medical beginning to offer Medicare Advantage, essentially, for that type of supplemental policy. So, Know what you have as far as your options and what's available to you uh, before you make any bigger long-term decisions. So how much can you expect to pay after going on to Medicare? This is well, um, one of the... Go yeah. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, you know, the, the basic expenses are going to be your monthly premium. So you need to know exactly what those look like. They do, and we're going to talk about IRMA charges. So they do means tested. So if you have a certain amount of income coming in, um, you're going to pay more than if you don't have as much coming in. So monthly premiums are going to be expected, out-of-pocket costs, deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, any payments to providers for non-covered services. So you need to understand exactly what is covered yep. within your specific plan as well. Correct. That's what a good and financial so plan does. Is, I'm not selling you a financial plan, but this takes all yeah. that to the surface, right? Because it's going to look at, we study out-of-pocket costs. I mean, the programs we use do, but then we verify them, um, which are all the out-of-pocket costs you could have. And there are people, by the way, that will have out-of-pocket costs above and beyond all this coverage. Um, there's a period of time later in life um, and that as you become more frail and issues or more health issues arise, that you might have some additional out-of-pocket costs uh, overall. So plan is going That's to work right. to and, estimate and that too. So you probably, if you've listened to us at all, especially on Financial Fitness Friday on, on our podcast, at, on YouTube, The Real Investment Show or the radio, um, this is something we talk about quite a bit. And, and here's one of the reasons we do is these monthly premiums include income related adjustment amounts. And we talk about how to give yourself flexibility in retirement while we talk about diversification of assets, not just between like, what type of stocks, large cap, mid cap, small cap. We talk about diversification of assets and what type of accounts you have. Because what we want to make sure you guys do as you're continuing to accumulate is giving yourself some flexibility where you do have some bigger ticket items you want to address or you're, you require more income. We don't want everything coming from a pre-tax account because, as you can see here, we have a two-year look-back window with these IRMA charges. So that income-related uh, monthly adjustment amount. We call that IRMA, kind of probably inside baseball. Uh, but your premiums will begin to go up. And if you're married, this is for both of you. So monthly Part B premium currently is $164.90. If you make under $97,000 modified adjusted gross income and you're single, or $194 modified adjusted gross income joint. Now, you get above that a little bit, you can see that premium starts to jump, $65.90. Uh, Part D premium begins to go up from $40 by 1220. So a lot of this is just finding other ways to keep more money in your pocket. So 
So this is that stealth tax that we talk about when we talk about it with a lot of younger people. They're like, what are you, what are you even talking about? I have no idea. And even we have people who are on Medicare, Rich, that how many times have you, you visited with somebody who had no idea about these types of charges? And all of a sudden they see that their premiums go up and say, what the heck happened here? It's, uh, you got to be aware of the fact that there's these base premiums. And then how do I get the whammy of the income related adjustment amount and what triggers that as well? So that is where, again, when you start taking distributions from your pre tax account to create a retirement income check, that kicks into that modified, modified adjusted gross income box. If you all want to spend $200,000 to pay off your mortgage because you feel better about it, Danny and I are going to go, well, let's see how much your Medicare premium is going to go up in the next couple of years. So it all has an effect. So we look at just, this. It's not just federal income tax, yeah. right, Danny? There's more to it. Yeah, but I mean, we, we have seen exactly that example. We've seen it for... Um, you know, Roth conversions, we take that in consideration. If we look at a Roth conversion mm -hmm. strategy, we want to convert some funds. And there may be an argument that it's okay to go pay these additional charges, uh, depending on, you know, what we foresee in the future. Um, but at the end of the day, it needs to be a consideration. I've seen it with lake houses. Somebody said, hey, just retired. I'm buying a lake house. Well, all of their funds were in pre-tax and it bumped them way up in IRMA charges. So here's what the average monthly, monthly premiums for supplemental insurance is. So original Medicare, Medigap policy, about 200 bucks. Uh, drug plan, $40. Medicare Advantage plan, $50. As Rich mentioned earlier, there are times you do see where you think, wow, this is great. I don't have any monthly premium, but what else is there out there that, what is it not covering? What do you need to consider? Um, and so this kind of gives you an idea as far as what you can expect. Yeah, not, not, all not all premium, right? It's, you got to look That's at right. this holistically, right? Think of the, um, think of it like a three-dimensional kind of thing, right? Because it's, it's, yes, on one side, what you pay in premium is important. But on the other side, and we're going to get into it now, are out-of-pocket costs. So if you have good supplemental insurance, your deductibles, your co-insurance amounts for hospitalizations and medical services might be mostly covered, Right. Okay, could still have co-payments. Um, and, you know, Medigap doesn't cover dental care, routine vision, or hearing care. But when you have to look at what ultimately, with a Medicare Advantage plan, your out-of-pocket cost could be if you had a serious illness that took a long time and surgeries and other things that would maybe, yeah, I had this great low deductible because I'm healthy and I don't go to the doctor much, but is it really going to work for you if you have a bit of serious illness and there are more out-of-pocket costs that you're going to have? So you got to weigh that out. If your current health is sort of iffy and you're in a good an enrollment period where you're not going to have this pre-existing condition clause, then people that have sort of a history of health issues, Danny, I almost insist no Medicare Advantage for you. <laughs> you are going to have to do a Medicare supplemental, a Medigap policy. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so the other aspect, we, we did touch on this a little bit as well, is that payment for non-covered services. So dental, vision, hearing, alternative care, um, you can get standalone policies for this. They're typically not that expensive. So keep that in mind. Now, one advantage or quote unquote advantage to Medicare Advantage is that it is a little bit more comprehensive that they'll cover all of this within one plan a lot of times. So yeah. where you'll see, hey, I'm going to get Medicare Advantage. It does cover dental, does cover vision, does cover hearing. Still not always the best avenue for you to go. You know, listen, I'm not, we're not poo-pooing Medicare Advantage. We're just saying is we prefer Medigal. And you go to Medicare.gov, as Danny says, not Medicare.iffy or all the other Medicare goofy things that come up, Medicare.eu.gov, whatever. 
Well, I've seen some crazy stuff. Um, these, these, these are in letters. G is the most comprehensive. Well, you got to look down the list of all the Medigap standardized plans. Do you travel out of the country? Oh, okay, then I am going to probably need to. Well, you know, you don't have to take the, the Cadillac plan. Because every plan, if I buy my, my G from Aetna, Humana, United Health, doesn't matter. It's standardized. So you got to fit that into your plan. So we're going to go give you an idea of what a monthly budget might look like for this. So this is what you're probably going to pay. Your Part B base premium, that's assuming you're not going over and uh, triggering IRMA. Then there's my Medigap premium, right? And say I want G. I want the Cadillac. And then I'm going to pay for my Part D drug plan. So, Danny, how many people do you have that say, you know, I don't take drugs. I don't take any prescription drugs. So I'm not going to do it. During my enrollment period, I'm just not going to do it. Then what happens? Sorry, Rich, trying, trying to get to answer a couple questions here. No, um, no, so think about, think about that for a minute, right? Because there are people that have not ever taken a prescription drug. But if they don't sign up within the window for Part D, they too are going to have an enrollment penalty, a late enrollment penalty. I think it's 63 days. So we tell people, listen, get the cheapest. You're not on a statin. You're not on a drug. That's great. But in 15 years, you might be. So get the cheapest Part D plan you have, can get because you have the ability every year through Medicare open enrollment, right, that starts in October and ends in December, to research your prescription drug plan. Regardless, you always have the ability to research and do your homework, and you should every year, on your drug D plan. So we tell people, listen, get your drug D plan even though you're not taking them, because then the enrollment penalties are ticky. So we get the slow, you know, the cheapest one that we, we can. Dental out of pocket, vision out of pocket, just giving you a rough idea of what it's gonna cost. But so let me explain something about Medicare and all this stuff. This is sort of affordable. If I'm getting insurance on the healthcare marketplace, we already talked to you about going from age 62 to 65, right? And I wanna try to get transition coverage. The cheapest yeah. transition coverage I've seen, Danny, is about $12,000 with like a six $5,000 deductible. And I'm pretty much getting catastrophic coverage. In, so for, for older Americans, this program allows us to really hone in on your health care costs and know what they're going to be. Yeah. So um, this is, I, I know this can be eye-opening for a lot of you. This is actually pretty good. Uh, but <laughs> this is intended to kind of give you and tell you exactly what you should expect because it's not cheap, but this is a heck of a lot better than going out on your own and getting all the insurance on your own. It's just so absolutely. Absolutely. And I understand the out-of-pocket vision. There are a lot of dental programs. There are a lot of vision programs out there um, issued by very, very popular companies. And most of them, when I've done my homework, they do resemble your vision and dental plan that your employer has. I mean, I, I you know, candidly, I don't think dental coverage and vision coverage at your employers are not that, they're not that great. I mean, they, I've seen private policies that people are purchasing um, with their Medicare G's that pretty much sort of covered what they did at work and they're not getting any better or work coverage. Big kicker here is just transitioning yeah. to Medicare, making sure that you're doing this properly. So determine your effective date. So uh, the first of month that you, first of the month that you turn 65 mm -hmm. or go off a 20 plus employer plan. So, Remember, when you turn 65, you're going to have a seven-month window that you can go and, and claim your benefits. You have three months prior to the month you turn 65, the month you turn 65, and then three months after. So that's that seven-month window. If you hear us talk about that, that's exactly what that means. Uh, now, if you are on that 20-plus employer creditable plan, then you have a special enrollment period. 
that is a eight month window, which starts the month that you stop the plan. So remember, COBRA does not count for that. But the moment you hang it up, you retire, um, you're done, you get off the plan, you're going to have to go and that eight month window starts, you'll have to get your uh, benefits and sign up during that window. I would advise you to go ahead and start that process uh, sooner rather than later and not wait until after you're done, especially if it's already pre-planned. I have people that I tell them three months before you're going to leave your creditable coverage job, you are going to start your homework and you're going to have it all laid out and ready to go. And then the month before you retire, you're going to sign up or the month you retire to make sure you're keeping your, your employer coverage and you don't have a gap. So three months before you leave your employer, you're gonna to start to need to do your homework. And I'm telling you, it's not that difficult, right? This is a good checklist right here, three to five months. I have, if, you're, if you're ultra paranoid like me, you didn't do it five months to six months earlier. I say, be normal, three months is fine. Um, especially if you're working with people like us that can guide you through the web, should give you an idea of what you need to look at. We can crystallize this for you. It's not as difficult as it all sounds. What's difficult is all these enrollment periods. I got an annual enrollment period. I got a special enrollment period. I got a general enrollment period. I'm drowning in enrollment periods. There's legislation out there to put them all into one enrollment period. But yeah, you know how government works. That's going to come through anytime soon. So you have eight months from the time you leave your employer, but don't take it. You got to start three to five months before your effective date. This yep, is where I think, absolutely. Danny, I think you can't, you know where I think you can talk to your friends who are on Medicare? You know what I think you can talk to them about, even though I would say, like you said earlier, Medicare supplemental. Mm, yeah, look at my watch. I got a new Fitbit. Yeah, mm, that's not going to sell me. But a lot of people that are gone on to Medicare, they did a lot of homework for vision and dental. Like they, they've gone through this and, and have been on these programs and they're great resources. I got to ask one of my clients. She did an Excel spreadsheet. I got it. I got it on dental coverage. I have never seen such an extensive analysis on dental coverage in my life. So sometimes your, your people that you know, you, you wanna do talk to them, you wanna talk to your doctor, they may know of a good dental plan or have heard. And, and, and that's where I would tell you that, go with other people and see what they say, get their experiences um, on the supplemental stuff outside of the healthcare stuff, the vision and dental. Not a bad idea. No, not a bad idea at all. I think doing your homework here is going to pay, um, you know, and I have some people that say, hey, I, I don't think I need to go three to five months. And, you know, like I'm, for giving an example, I have somebody that turned 65 here mid-June. They said, look, May 1st, I'm going to start looking, shopping around. You know, another big thing I think that you need to take in consideration, especially if you're talking to somebody that does sell healthcare insurance, make sure they're independent. Um, you know, and it's okay. There's a lot of these really good plans that are out there, but if they only work for Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or um, any of the other bigger plans or even smaller, you're not getting an apples to apples comparison. You're only getting that what that one provider may offer you. So make sure uh, you're I, out, you're shopping the plans from somebody's independent. I have to just tell you something because this still blows me away. I still have this spreadsheet. It's not to ramble on because everybody's at lunch. But she's got Premier Elite, Premier Plus, Premier Max, Cigna Dental, Cigna Dental 1000. I mean, she has done all this homework. <laughs> I, miss. I should ask her to update this so we could have it for people. It's a great, I'll send it to you, Danny. But I mean, I don't expect, she's, a, she's an engineer. I expect this from her. <laughs> but I was totally impressed with this spreadsheet. You know, some people embrace the homework. So annually in the fall, review your plan documents for coming co come the coming year, Medicare Advantage, drug plans, consider any new plans if you need to save any money. I think this is certainly a consideration. Um, you know, a lot of money is left on the table as well, because once you get on a Medicare, you're not shopping it during that general enrollment period. Uh, make sure that you're looking for options when you can change. Um, that annual enrollment period will typically 
opened up for somebody who's already on Medicare in October, go through December. Um, make sure that as you're already on it, that you're considering that as you move forward. Everybody should be every October to do December. They should be investigating their drug plans and or Medicare Advantage, just like Danny said. Because you want it, it's not just cost, but maybe there's a, a, a favored pharmacy. Maybe the drug that you have is no longer going to be covered. You will get disclosure statements for changes to your plan before enrollment period, and people don't read them. So you've got to read that stuff. But I will tell you, it's best for you to go ahead and investigate and spend the time, especially if you're Medicare Advantage, every enrollment period. I don't have to change my part key or part, uh, whatever, I do, whatever kind of Medigap I choose. I really, you know, it's open network. Unless I'm having a real problem with my insurance company. They're all pretty similar. You ever see when people get all ticked off at AT&T and go to Verizon? And then they get ticked off at Verizon and they go to AT&T? I'm like, you all are like playing ping pong with yourself. It's the same thing. You're just going to be frustrated with the new company. Right. But Medicare Advantage and drug plans is something important that you have to keep in mind. So I want to go through one of the things that I saw from uh, Daniel. Um, when we run Roth analysis, we take into account the fact the goal of a retirement income analysis to craft a tax effective retirement income strategy is to pull money from pre tax accounts into Roth accounts brokerage accounts, whatever it might be. There's a little pain up front because the goal of the plan is to make sure that, listen, you might have Irma for the, regardless, just because of your income need, but it's to level it out over time. So when the first part of it's a front-loaded Roth conversion plan, your Irma is going to spike. And then, your IRMA is going to go like this, and then it's going to level. So no matter what expenses you're taking, no matter how much more income you need because of inflation, you are not causing this IRMA distress. A little pain up front for a lot of tax satisfaction along the way. Think of it like a speed bump, and then you move. So that's important is a little pain today. Now, keep in mind also that Irma doesn't last forever. There are people that will have, oh, my gosh, 2022, I took this money out of my IRA. I had this situation. I had a client uh, last year. She had to help her child. And I understood it. And I approved it. But I said, here's what's going to happen. And she took quite a bit of money out of her IRA. Um, now, she's going to put it back, but it's just going to go into her non-IRA. So, but I said, now I can't do it. You know, sometimes you have an exception through SSA dash uh, SSA dash four four. You have an extenuating circumstance, a lot of money that's come in, like leaving employment, and you can you can remove this IRMA issue. But the, for taking money out of your IRA just because you want to help somebody or money out of your IRA to live, that's not one of the conditions. So I told her in twenty four twenty twenty four, Danny, she's going to be the third tier. There's nothing we could do. But then, right, she's going to drop back down. She'll actually drop back down to the base premium again. So it doesn't go on forever unless you can keep doing this thing. This, that's it's why a, it's we, a two-year period. Two-year period, right. So whatever, to implicate, whatever decisions you make today, and I'm assuming that, say, you're on Medicare, any decisions I make today, depending on how much money I pull out of my pre-tax account or capital gain or whatever it might be, is going to affect me two years from now. Well, and, and keep in mind, so even when you're 63, you want to start making these considerations prior to 65. Daniel right. just brought up in the webinar chat uh, something that you and I talk about quite frequently but haven't talked about yet today was the form SSA 44. Uh, right. And that's a form that if you have a work stoppage, a death in the family, a major life event, you can fill this form out. It's eight pages in total, but it's only three that you need to be concerned with on the second page. It'll uh, you'll actually say, you know, I had a work stoppage or I had um, a pension payout. 
you're going to be able to go in, check the box, and then actually appeal and show, hey, my income is going to be reduced. Here's what we think it'll be. So that way you're not paying those higher premiums. It can right. be a pain in the rear from time to time. I've seen a husband and a wife go in and, and actually go file the form and one will win it. The other one will not. Got to go back and do it again. But it is worth it. This is all about keeping as much money in your pocket as you can. SSA-44 is an excellent way to do so. Not everybody can use this, but if you can, I certainly recommend you give it a shot. And it's not that difficult to fill out. It's one of the easiest forms. It's not like, oh my gosh, like it's like a 10 night, it's like a tax form. No, no, it's not that difficult. What other yep. questions did we get, Danny? Perfect. Anything good? Any other questions we got? Yeah, we've got a couple. I mean, we kind of answered a lot of them, but so one of them was that you mentioned COBRA is not a credible plan. Does that mean I cannot contribute to my HSA eight months before I sign up for Medicare? Also, should I drop my COBRA when I turn 65 and go with Medicare and Medigap coverage? Um, so it's a six month window that you need to stop contributions to the HSA. Um, COBRA is not a creditable plan. So when you turn 65, Yes, ideally, you're still going to have that seven month window. Um, mm -hmm. And from there, you're going to want to so remember three months prior, the one month of your 65th birthday, and three months after, I would go ahead and drop that COBRA, sign up with Medicare and yes. Medigap uh, coverage. Now, yes. you may determine in, in, in some wild case, COBRA may be cheaper than Medigap. That's not always the case, but you're going to have to sign up for Medicare uh, for sure. Well, and you should sign up for Medigap because if you fall outside the pre-existing condition window and you do right. have one, That's true. You're, you, you're not going to be able to do it. So you yep. want to look at COBRA as something dangerous. I hate to say it. Take it a co COBRA. You want to look at the COBRA. I should get a COBRA puppet. I get that. Um, because oh, it, it will give you, it will do it for you. It's not good. So if you have COBRA and you're 65 or you're three months before you're 65, you're going to shut that COBRA down. You go, I mean, and I mean, you're going to get your, all that other stuff in order and come off of COBRA at 65. I wouldn't, I would not deviate from that. And again, you go to medicare.gov, type in there, Medigap at the top, see the grid of all the letters, G being the Cadillac plan, and look at all the different benefits and you might decide that wait, i'm never i have a client that's never going to leave the country dan doesn't want to do that we didn't have to go for g medigap coverage we didn't have to have to go through the cadillac plan we we went for something else but we went through a medigap policy yep very good point rich so uh, another question do you still sign up for medicare part d even if acquiring a medigap plan um the answer would be yes uh, another one to kind of piggyback off that from somebody else with Part D, can you just choose the least expensive if you are currently not using any prescriptions and switch to a different later if needed without penalty? Yes, that would be ideal. That's uh, a good idea. See. But keep this in mind when I want you all to think about this. Part A and Part B are Swiss cheese. When I buy a slice of Swiss cheese, there's always going to be holes. So I'm always, but I always have to buy the Swiss cheese first. I always got to get the part A, part B, assuming you're not, right? Even with Medicare Advantage, I have to do A and B. That, that's, the, that's the foundation. Now it's how I fill the holes. That's going to make the difference. And yes, if I had to be on part D, I'm going for the cheapest plan that I can find. I am going by cost if I'm not taking anything. Um, then I will switch. Yep, absolutely. So another question, when should you sign up for Social Security and Plan B? Uh, now, these are going to be contingent on a handful of things, right? We want to run a Social Security maximization uh, analysis to understand what would be best for you and your family on when you sign up for Social Security. Uh, plan B, that's going to be contingent on, are you still working? Are you covered under a spousal plan? Uh, a lot of those other questions that we kind of went through within this webinar. If uh, you know, I would advise you to reach out to your advisor to work with us. We have a lot of very experienced uh, advisors who all who can help you with this. If you have specific questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we're also going to have a survey here at the end of this. Please take it. Let us know if there's other topics you want us to cover. We try to do one or two of these every month or so. That way we're staying on top of some topics that are important to you guys. But we know it's important to you by you letting us know as well. 
So other topics that we have not addressed or you want us to do something else, let us know. We do appreciate y'all spending your time with us today. I know we've gone a little bit over an hour, a lot of really good questions. I know it's a ton of information. So if you'd like for us to cover anything else or want somebody from RIA to, RIA to reach out to you, please let us know in the uh, survey and we'll get right back with you. But um, go ahead, Rich. Tomorrow, I'll be crabby on the radio. Tune in. Um, and we are going to have another, we're going to have a candid coffee coming up one day, June, June 3rd. Thank you, Brent. And it's really going to be, oh, we got an ad that's funny. But it's really about this uh, financial malaise. How do we break out of it? What do we do in our household? It'll be some interesting tips. If you have anything that you have a question about. But this is our Saturday morning coffee gathering. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. So we hope you can attend. It's before you start your day. They tend to be popular. We started those during the pandemic. So we hope you're able to sign up to, go ahead and sign up to. Uh, yeah, and I'm always in my robe. Uh, Danny's Danny. So he's going to be in his SPA. Yeah, it depends, depends on the day, right? Where I'm at. I may be at the ballpark whenever we're doing this next one. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. So All right, guys. Well, thank you Thanks so much again, for everybody. with us. Let us Bye, know, everybody. What, uh, you know what you'd like to cover, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Yeah.